And so with that, would you please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We are concluding, finally, chapter 15. It's been a lot of verses there, spent a lot of time there. Let's read our final verse in this chapter, verse 58. Therefore, and that is in light of everything that we studied up until this point, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Let's pray. It's you that we long to see, Lord Jesus. It's your voice that we long to hear and need to hear through your word. Spirit of God, would you exalt Christ? Would you let his will and his glorious gospel be made known this morning through the preaching? We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, there's a, a plethora of things that we can waste our time on in life. Uh, I came across an article this week. It offered three things that are not worth the effort. So perhaps you'll find some of these helpful. Um, I would say I agree with most of them. I have a little insert here and there where I might speak otherwise. But the first thing that this article said is not worth the effort is to stay in unhappy situations. Many people stay in unhappy situations when they're unhappy or unfulfilled because they've, always, they've already done so much right, to be in that situation in the first place. And so therefore, some just stay put because they feel that they're expected to. They don't want to rock the boat. And this author is saying, you shouldn't feel bound to your past decisions just because of how you've worked on them or because you're expected to. Instead, learn from the situation and move on. For example, you may be choosing to get a college degree because it's an expectation placed upon you when there's other ways to progress in life. Maybe you stay in a bad job for an extended period of time, even if you hate the job because you feel like it's, it's, just, it's the easiest option. Making plans, though, and attending new interviews, that might help create long-term, sustainable ways to move forward. Maybe you remain in an unhappy relationship because it's convenient. You don't want to be alone. You're comfortable with the routine. And at the end of the day, you're going to regret staying in the situation like this, and you can choose to work on the relationship or call it quits. Here's my caveat. <laughs> the world would have you believe this is true even in marriage. But you must remember that marriage is about more than your happiness. And there is hope for every marriage in Christ, even difficult ones. The second thing this article says is it's not worth it to mistreat your body for the sake of enjoyment. People do all kinds of things to their bodies because they think they're too young to deal with any problems relating to it. And it isn't as bad as it seems. Unfortunately, it is that bad. And the effects add up over time. I was just talking with Rusty this morning about how old we're getting and all these injuries we got when we were younger are starting to really take their toll on us now. It's not worth the effort, even the fun that you have in the process to damage your body in this way. And then the article goes on to list several things like eating a lot of junk food, getting drunk all the time, doing hard drugs, not getting enough sleep, avoiding medical checkups. And according to the article, he says the, the key is moderation. Remember, mistreating your body isn't worth the effort, but treating it well while making room for some fun is acceptable. And lastly, it's not worth it to hold on to the past. A lot of people are stuck in the past. When you live in the past, you trap yourself. You give up years of, and years of your life to focus on things long ago, long gone. And here are some things that you may be doing to live in the past. You fear change. Normal to be afraid of some change, but resisting it isn't worth the effort because change is inevitable. Things will change whether you want them to or not. Holding grudges, resentment is a waste of energy. You may have good reason, but anger will also hold you back. Studies have found that resentment is bad for you. Forgiveness is a much more worthwhile use of your time, and it helps you find peace so your efforts don't remain wasted. You may be able to salvage the relationship or it may be best for you just to let it go. 
Last one they list is trying to get back to an old you. Yeah, this one speaks to me. You know, when you hit a slump, some desire to go back to an old version of themselves. But you're failing to realize that the person that you, all, that you are now is already better than the old you. You've grown in wisdom and knowledge. Instead, aim to become the best person you are now. If you genu- genuinely want to overcome your past, learn from it. Pick out the lessons, identify the root of the difficulties you faced, and then move on with your life with those lessons. All right, so you've had a good little pep talk here about things that you don't want to waste your time on. Three of them I've given you, at least from that one author's perspective, that are not worth the effort. Well, in contrast, I want to give you one thing. One thing that you will never regret. Your work for the Lord. How do I know this? I know this because Christ rose from the dead. Paul's conclusion to this amazing chapter on the resurrection is that Christ's resurrection guarantees you will never regret your labor for the Lord. Christ's resurrection guarantees you will never regret regret your labor for the Lord. For for, for the person whose joy and passion and commitment it is to give your time and your treasure and your talents in service to Christ and His church, there will never, in all the eternal ages to come, be a moment where you think, "I, I wish... I would not have served the Lord as much as I did. That will not be a moment. There will not be a moment that you gave in service to Christ that will have been in vain. Not even one. When you stand in eternity in this glorified supernatural body that we've had described to us by Paul, and we're overwhelmed by rapturous joy of being in the physical presence of our Savior, to whatever degree that you can at that point look back over your earthly life, your thought will never be, I wish I'd done more for myself. And when this world and everything in it has passed away, all its meaningless distractions, all its vain pursuits, the furthest thought from your mind will be, I wish I would have spent more time with my hobbies. Why? Because Christ's resurrection guarantees that you will never regret your labor for the Lord. What a glorious truth to be reminded of this morning. Have you all heard of the 80-20 rule in churches? You know what the 80-20 rule is? 20% of those in the church do 80% of the work. This message is for the 20%. May this message encourage you to continue serving, to continue giving with confidence, with zeal, to deny yourself without doubt, without regret, and to consider others as more important even more than you already do. The title, of this, the title of this final message from chapter 15 is Abounding in Your Work for the Lord. Abounding in Your Work for the Lord. And in this one verse, Paul looks back over this chapter and he gives each of us four goals to pursue that will minimize regret and maximize your joy today, tomorrow, and forever. Love dearly your gospel family. Stand immovable in gospel truth. Abound always in gospel work and believe confidently in gospel hope. We'll go through each one of these. You know, as we've worked our way through this chapter, you may have wondered how Paul felt about those in the church whom he has sought to correct on and instruct and admonish and so forth on several occasions 
in this letter and even in this past chapter. He's corrected and instructed them on the necessity of resurrection and transformation of our earthly bodies. And we can stop wondering how he feels about them. They're very dear to him. Right? As he concludes, look, look at verse 58. He says, therefore, what does he call them? He calls them my beloved brethren. You know, Paul's had to address several issues about their theology, about their behavior, and yet they remain his dear brothers and sisters in the Lord. Back in chapter 4, he referred to himself as their father through the gospel. And, and, that, and that certainly is, is true, but in a greater sense, Paul saw he and they as brothers and sisters because they each have God as their Father. It was God who he says in, in, in verse 57, right before, he says, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, he's including himself right along with them. To whatever degree Paul labored to minister Christ to them, he was just as much a recipient of grace and just as much in need of the Lord's victory as they were. If you want to minimize your regrets, maximize your joy. Then make it your joy, first of all, to love dearly your gospel family. Love dearly your gospel family. In His providence, the Lord has put you in this church and He has made you part of a family that has its roots in the gospel. And if you're a member of this church, this church is your family in Christ by means of the gospel. So love your gospel family. Like any family, you're going to run into challenges of all kinds. Everyone is difficult to love at one time or another. If you don't think that, you've just not been around them enough. Live with them for a couple weeks, and I'm sure you'll feel differently. And my point is that, is that the people that God has you serving Christ alongside, they are your brothers. And they are your sisters in the Lord. And they should be dear to you. Even when they say or do things that you don't appreciate or agree with. Paul's disagreed and corrected and rebuked and admonished the Corinthians. And yet he still maintains a strong affection for them in the Lord. So with those in the church, you are not always going to see eye to eye. You're not even going to see eye to eye on scriptural truths. There's going to be theological deficiencies in people. Disagreements with people along the way. And you know what? The devil, he would love for those differences to drive wedges between us. But that can't happen if you remember that such differences are really opportunities for listening and for learning, for teaching and for exhorting, for encouraging and understanding and loving each other. That's what happens in families. And that's what should be happening here in our gospel family at the Cornerstone Bible Church. You want to know what will increase your love for your gospel family? It is to share an unshakable faith in the gospel. Right? It is, as Paul says here, it is to be steadfast. It is to be immovable. If you want to minimize your regrets and you want to maximize your joy in life today, tomorrow, and forever, then make it your goal to secondly, stand immovable in gospel truth. Stand immovable in gospel truth. Now, just a few verses back, verses 33 and 34, <clears throat> there Paul was exhorting them. He says, stop sinning. He was talking to those who had objected to the resurrection. But now here, though, in verse 58, when he comes, he's bringing the plane in for a landing. Everything is coming together. He's admonishing them, but not about in a moral sense, like stop sinning like he did earlier. He's admonishing them about the work of the gospel. And so this suggests that, that Paul has taken his focus off those who were the objectors and he's raised it now up to the whole congregation 
And he's saying to all of them, don't allow yourselves to be led astray by denying the resurrection of the dead. Stay right where the Lord found you and let nothing move you. Be steadfast. Be immovable. And this word for steadfast is a word that refers to being seated. A person who is seated is firmly situated. They're settled. The word translated immovable carries the same basic idea, but, but with more intensity. You are totally settled. You're motionless. You're immobile. And this was, this was Paul's, the way that Paul opened up this chapter 15. Look, look back at the beginning. Look at what he said there. He says, Now I make known to you, brethren, verse 1, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you also stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. See, he admonished them to stand, to stand in the gospel that allows you to stand justified before a holy God. They should not allow anything to knock them loose from that which anchors them to the testimony about Christ that has been established amongst them through Paul's preaching. Namely, that he died for their sins, he was buried, he was raised on the third day, and then he appeared to many. That was the gospel that Paul preached. That was the gospel that they received by faith and by which they were saved. And he says, if you lose grip on that foundational truth of the gospel of a resurrected Christ, you move away from that. This is his warning to them. He says, you move away from this, you will have believed in vain. You know, this is not the only time that Paul has issued a warning to believers about the dangerous possibility of believing in vain. In other words, there is a very real danger to your walk with Christ in failing to prioritize increasing your knowledge, your understanding, your confidence in who the Scriptures say Christ is and what the Scriptures say Christ has accomplished for us through His death. Right? There is a very real danger in not prioritizing your understanding of these vital things. And Paul issues this warning on several occasions. We see it here to Corinth. Turn also to the book of Colossians. I want to walk you through this. I want, to, I want you to see how he addresses them and what he warns them of. Colossians chapter 1. Follow along with me as I read. He begins in chapter 1, verse 3. He says, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also, since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. See, Paul is he's rejoicing. He's rejoicing that the gospel was, is constantly bearing fruit in their lives, and he says it's been bearing fruit in their life since they first heard and understood God's grace. And that increasing has been continuing on all the way up until the present when he's writing them. See, they were growing because they were pursuing growth in the word of truth, he calls it. Now jump down to verse 9. He says, for this reason also, we have not ceased to pray for you, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for the attaining of, what does it say there? steadfastness and patience. See, Paul wants them to know 
I want you to know what I'm praying for you, Colossians. Namely, that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will for them. You know, if, if I pray, let's say, for your thirst to be satisfied, or if I pray for your, that your hunger would be satiated, I'm not praying for some mystical thing to happen to your body where you just, oh, I'm not thirsty anymore. I'm not hungry anymore. I'm praying that you will drink the water, that you will eat the food that's available to you and you'll be satisfied and satiated. See, Paul here, in what he just prayed, he's not praying for some mystical filling of their minds with knowledge, as if all of a sudden, like on the matrix, I know Kung Fu, you know. It's not just some download into our brains that he's praying for. He's praying that they will avail themselves of the spiritual resources that they have available to them. They'll read the Scriptures. They'll sit under the preaching of the Word. They'll fellowship with the the saints. They'll speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It bore all kinds of glorious fruit in their lives, Paul says. But notice what this personal commitment to the Scriptures, what it also did. It produced steadfastness, he says. Steadfastness. And then, Paul zeroes in on Christ. Who He is. What His death accomplished. Verse 13, he says, For He, Christ, He rescued us from the domain of darkness. He transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities or things. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself. Having made peace through the blood of His cross, through Him I say whether things on earth or things in heaven, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And then comes the warning. Verse 23. If. See, that's a warning. If. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. There's the warning. And don't doubt that this is true, friend. Don't doubt it. God is sovereign over your salvation. We believe that wholeheartedly. The Scriptures teach that. All those whom God foreknew, they will be conformed to the image of His Son. All whom He calls, He will also justify and glorify, the Scriptures say. Christ promises that nothing will separate Him from those who are His. And while these glorious statements of His persevering grace are true, there is a corresponding reality that you as a follower of Christ also must take seriously. You are responsible to pursue a path of growing and deepening your knowledge of God and of Christ and His grace and His Gospel through His Word. And if you don't do that, If you are not compelled to prioritize your spiritual growth because God's grace towards you, yeah, it's it's good. It's, It's needful. But it just doesn't melt you. And it doesn't amaze you. And it doesn't astound you. And it doesn't humble you over and over and increasingly. Then, my friends, your profession of belief in Christ, it will likely prove to be vain in the end. 
And this is not a contradiction to the Bible's teaching that God sovereignly causes His people to persevere in the faith. It is the way that He reveals that He never knew you at all. You believed, but in vain. And the evidence of that vain belief, it was right in front of you, staring at you all along. The grace of God which should have astounded you and gripped you and defined your life, it didn't in the end. Which means it didn't at the first. Do you want to know who's such a warning as Paul gives here to the Colossians and as Paul issues here in verse 58 about believing in vain? Do you want to know who such a warning as this is for? It's for the person who came in here this morning and would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. And yet they leave here unmoved. Unchanged by what God has just had me say to you through the Word. You're blind to the warning signs that say you have believed in vain. You see, because the the one whose heart is gripped by Christ and by His grace, here's what they're thinking right now. Here's what they're asking themselves right now based on what I just said and read from the book of Colossians. They're saying, is, is, is He talking about me? Is He talking about my faith and my walk? Oh God, I've been, I've been lax in reading Your Word. I've not been pursuing growth in the knowledge of who you are and your grace. My sin, my sin has made me take your grace for granted. My heart, it's grown callous towards you. I know I've wandered from you, Jesus. Don't let me go, please. I repent, Lord, I repent. And they remember from where they've fallen. And they repent. And they do the deeds that they did at the first. That is what standing immovable in gospel truth looks like. And that is what you will do if you are truly His and have not believed in vain. Now what we've seen so far is that to minimize your regrets, maximize your joy, you must make it your goal to love dearly your gospel family and to stand immovable in gospel truth. There's more. You must also abound always in gospel work. That's how also you know you haven't believed in vain. You abound in gospel work always. It's always on your mind. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren, back in chapter 15, verse 58, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. The word for abounding, it carries the idea of exceeding requirements Overflowing, overdoing. He's talking about zeal in service to Christ. And we can see this pictured in the life, let's say, of a 17th century preacher in England by the name of Samuel Crook. It was said of him that he abounded in the Lord's work in his ministry. His motto was known to be, I'm willing to spend and be spent. One time when he was sick, His doctor told him, he said, you know what, you'd live longer if you preach less. And Crook's reply was, in keeping with his motto, he said, alas, if I may not labor, I cannot live. What good will life do me if I be hindered from the goal of living? You ever wonder why those who are in the 20% are always willing and always the ones who are eager to serve? On the flip side, have you ever wondered why you lack a desire to serve in ways that you could? Why other things always seem to be more appealing, more important, more enjoyable, more profitable to you than serving? Or to use Paul's words, what work are you always abounding in? Your work or the Lord's work? See, there is a motivation that is underlying what you choose to abound in. What makes someone so zealous to serve the Lord so often? Well, Paul gives us the answer in 
in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Let me turn there. We've got time. Ephesians 1. I'll give you until I get there. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. It says, In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, His death, right? That's the reference to blood. We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us. And that word lavished is the same word as abounding. So the translation, it could read this way, according to the riches of His grace, which He made abundant towards us. See, when you realize and remind yourself often of how God has so abundantly overdone Himself for you, how you, you who, who deserve nothing, nothing from Him, you who've actually earned His condemnation, it's then that the desire to overdo ourselves in service to Him is born and it grows and it just keeps on growing. Because you keep going back to the gospel of grace and you keep delving into the word and just keep reading about his grace towards you and it just keeps fanning this flame within you to serve him. And so to the 20% of you who do 80% of the work, Paul says, don't stop. Keep on abounding. And to the 80%, he says, let's change that number. Let's make it 50%. Let's make it, let's flip it. Let's make it 80% are doing the work in the church, not just the 20%. He's inviting you to come in to always abound in the work of the, war, of, the, of the Lord. Why? Because you're not wasting your life when you do that. You are forsaking the trivial and the insignificant and the short-lived things of this world for what? For the weighty, the meaningful, the eternal things of God. You know, the, the person in the 20%, they could take it easy. But you don't. Because you desire those who are lost to be found. You desire believers to be built up. To be encouraged. To be helped in all kinds of ways. You can't seem to reconcile yourself to say, I've served enough. Done my part. Let the rest of the work be done by someone else. Now, an important question to ask here. Does that mean you should feel guilty when you rest? When you take a vacation? No. No, I don't think... First of all, I don't think any in this church are in that category. I just can't take a vacation. We love our vacations. How much money has been spent at Disneyland just in this past year by this church? Probably a lot. See, we all understand that rest is important and even necessary. There is a proper place for rest, for relaxation, for taking a break. See, that is reasonable. But if you're going to err, friends, your brother Paul here, he's urging you to err on the side of doing more, not less work for the Lord. John MacArthur, he, re he reminds us of two great modern idols of our present generation. Leisure and relaxation. Far too many Christians bow, bow down at their altars. See, the Christian's view of rest and relaxation and diversions, what should the Christian view of these things be? You get your rest, you relax, you take a break. Why? So that you can refuel. So that you can Refresh and restore your energy in order that you can return with an increased effectiveness for Christ. But for many, though, rest and relaxation becomes an end in themselves, which means that they abound in them and give more of their attention and concern and time and energy to pursuing them. And while many a faithful saint has served on into old age, there, there's many who have abounded in service to Christ and ended up with a shortened life. Henry Martin, the British missionary to India and Persia, he determined to burn out for God. Those were his words. And he did so 
He died before he was 35 in service to Christ. David Brainerd, many of you have heard of him. He's one of the earliest missionaries to the American Indians. He died before he was 30. We don't know a great deal about Epaphroditus, whom Paul mentions in the book of Philippians. We know, though, that he was a brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier of Paul's. And, it says, and he says he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life. So while he was abounding in the work of the Lord, he became sick enough to die. Did these men, did others like them that are scattered throughout the history of the church, did they waste their life? No. Not according to Paul. Of Epaphroditus, Paul said, hold men like him in high regard. Once again, death by exhaustion in ministry, that's not the goal. Now, again, I don't think anybody here is aiming at that goal either. Robert Murray McShane, so in other words, I don't need to correct anybody directly. I'll talk to you privately if I think you're, you're headed in that direction. Robert Murray McShane graduated from Edinburgh University at 14 in 1827. I shudder to think what I was doing at 14. Certainly wasn't graduating from a university. By the time he was 23, he was leading a Presbyterian congregation of over a thousand. He worked so hard that his health finally broke. And before dying at the age of 29, this is what he wrote. God gave me a message to deliver and a horse to ride. Alas, I've killed the horse and now I can't deliver the message. I think there's wisdom in that regret. But I have no doubt that that regret was overshadowed by the greeting he received in heaven. Well done, good and faithful servant. You know, the Lord has not returned yet. And until he does, there's, there's, there's plenty of work to do. There are believers to reach, unbelievers to reach. There are ministries of all kinds to accomplish in the name of Christ. God would have you be faithful. He would have you use your gift to love the body as his spirit leads and to abound in that work. You have one life. Right? Don't, don't waste it on the meaningless and the trivial and the temporary. Invest everything that the Lord has given to you, your time, your talents, your money, your energy, your gifts, your bodies, your minds. Invest it all in work for the Lord. As James urges you, he says, show your faith by your work. Ministry is work. Abound always in gospel work. I want you to notice one last thing here. I want you to see what undergirds all that Paul says to them here. He says, Beloved brethren, he tells them, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. But why? What's the motivation here? Notice what the basis is for these admonitions. He says, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. See, the key to standing immovable in gospel truth and abounding always in gospel work, which is the way that you will minimize your regrets, you'll maximize your joy today, tomorrow, forever, is to believe confidently in gospel hope. Believe confidently in gospel hope. Don't just know about it. Don't just be able to quote the verses to talk about gospel hope. Look at those verses, know what they mean, and then live your life in light of them. There's a difference, you know, just knowing them versus living your life in light of them. Paul was concerned that their denial of the resurrection, he said, it might mean that my labor for the Lord in Corinth, as well as their salvation, it might prove to be vain. Right? That was the level of his concern about their denial of the resurrection. He says in verse 13, if you want to turn back there to verse 13, he says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. And guess what? Your faith also is vain. And so, what does he do? He presents to them 
right? In the rest of the chapter, strong evidence for the resurrection. And then he begins his argument. He brings, he, he brings it to a close by concluding that the resurrection is how they can know their own labor in the Lord is not in vain. It was the reality of the resurrection that gripped Paul to risk his life for the Gospel over and over. The resurrection justifies any risk that you take in service to Christ. right? Because he knew the resurrection was to come. This life is not all there is. This is not the only body you're going to have. If you wreck it in service to Christ, you're going to get a new one and a better one. And you'll have it forever. Those were the things that gripped him. It, it made him willing to face danger every hour, he said in verse 30. I face death daily for the sake of the believers I'm seeking to minister to. His life belonged to Christ. And so he said, my life needs to be defined by Christ. And if serving Christ involves sacrifice, if it leads even to death, well, he gains the reward of being with Christ and the rewards Christ chooses to give to him. In such a mindset, it defined and characterized and gave purpose to Paul's life and even his death. What is doing that for you? What is defining your life? What is prioritizing your life? Is it leisure? Is it recreation? Is it play? Is it hobbies? What is it? Or is it Christ? Because one is going to result in something that you will never regret. The other will result in things that you look back on and go, I wish I'd done things differently. Alexander Campbell was a Scots-Irish immigrant to the United States. He became an ordained minister. In 1829, he participated in a debate over the evidence of Christianity with a man named Robert Owen, who was a famous socialist who just a few years earlier in 1817 had publicly claimed that all religions were false. And so Owens visited Campbell on his farm to make arrangements for this debate and and one of the times that they were walking about the farm, they came to Campbell's family burial ground. And Owen, this, this unbeliever, stopped and he said to Campbell, you know, there's one advantage I have over Christians. I'm not afraid to die. Most Christians have fear in death, but if some few items of my business are settled, I should be perfectly, perfectly willing to die at any moment. And so Campbell replied to him, well... You say you have no fear in death? Have you any hope in death? Owens paused for a little thought and then said, no. And so Campbell then pointed to one of his ox that were standing nearby. He says, well then that puts you on the same level as that brute. He's fed until he's satisfied. He stands in the shade. He whisks off the flies and has neither hope nor fear in death. See, the hope of the Gospel is that the judgment for our sins that we all deserve after this life is over, it has already been faced by Christ. And for the Christian, there is no judgment There is no condemnation. There is no eternal separation from God. Are you confident in that hope? In that hope for you through your faith in Jesus Christ? And if you are, then be a planter. Be a waterer in God's field. Join in. Be a fellow workman on what God is building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Be working towards that day when Paul spoke of, which he spoke of back in chapter 3, when the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Work for the reward that Christ desires to give those who are steadfast and immovable and always abounding in the Lord's work. That day will prove to you the reality of Paul's words here. Your toil is not in vain in the Lord. In 1883, a man named Wilfred Grenfell came to Christ as a result of hearing a sermon preached by Dwight Moody, the famous evangelist. Several years later, he saw Mr. Moody in a Boston hotel, and so he came up to Moody and he said to him, Oh, Mr. Moody, 14 years ago, I put my faith in Jesus Christ after hearing you preach. And Moody turned to him and replied, Oh, what have you been doing since? 
Christ's resurrection guarantees that you will never regret your work for the Lord. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we need to hear this. Whether you're in the 20% or the 80% or somewhere in between, we all need to hear this to be spurred on to love and good deeds. We need to have Christ placarded before us as being worthy of grace, as being amazing, of our need as being great, and that gratitude is the response to all of this. Worship and gratitude make us a grateful people who are willing to show it by abounding always in our work for the Lord. Not to earn something we could never earn, but to, but to show our love and our joy in having been rescued from a place we could have never gotten out of or never avoided were it not for Christ's death for us. Thank you in Christ's name. Amen.